tonight, Nehemiah chapter 11. It's not a long chapter, but um, it's nonetheless, there's, there's, a, there's a few things in here that I think are important for us to kind of glean from and to look at. And, um, you know, while you're turning there to Nehemiah chapter 11, if you need a Bible, raise your hand because we have Bibles for you to follow along with us uh, through in the Old Testament as well as the New Testament. So um, raise your hand if you need one. But, you know, the, uh, as we've been studying through the book of Nehemiah, you know, we know that this is, they're all coming back to Jerusalem, right? They're all coming back to Jerusalem from Babylon. There's been different waves of people, if you will, through different leaders. One Zerubbabel, then uh, Ezra, and, uh, and then also we see in Nehemiah here with Nehemiah. And so, you know, these people are coming back to the place that's familiar to them, the place that they knew. And uh, some have gone to be with the Lord and some have not. And they are back in Jerusalem. That's where we find ourselves. They've been exiled to Babylon. They were in captivity. And uh, the population uh, of Jerusalem, when they were taken in captivity to where they are now in Jerusalem, and uh, is, is, uh, is different. It's just so drastically decreased, the population. And so the walls have been built on the whole original foundation. And with that being a, a larger city, it just makes it even more obvious that there's nobody in Jerusalem. I mean, the people aren't there. And so um, it's kind of like what we would think of like a ghost town. Uh, and, and we've been studying along as the rebuilding of the walls. We even know the homes, the dwellings weren't, 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 weren't sh shackles, basically. They, they were shabby and, and they weren't kept up at all because they'd been in captivity for how long? 70 years, right? I mean, a long time to be in captivity. And so there was no attention given to the city of Jerusalem. And as a result of that, things went into disarray and disrepair. So Nehemiah comes and he repairs the walls and repairs the gates and repairs the in part of the city. He still has yet more to do on that. But, you know, bottom line is, is that there needs to be people. I mean, a city is made up of people, right? It's not made up of just buildings. And so the people are, are to be in that city, and it's a blessing uh, to be in the city of Jerusalem. Last week, though, in chapter 10, um, it, was, it was a good uh, exhortation, a great teaching by, by, by Chris last week as he taught through chapter 10. And, and as I reread chapter 10 in preparation for chapter 11, um, I, I saw two things that have happened that are pretty glaring that Chris had brought out. One is separation from the peoples of the land. That's right at the very beginning of chapter 10. That's what they're doing. They're sanctifying themselves. They're setting themselves apart. They're, they're separating themselves from the peoples of the land so that all those Gentiles, all of those outside the land of Judah, and remember, you know, the, Persia had reign over that place, all over that whole land during this time. Judah, Samaria, and the outer areas, uh, and so forth, uh, Ophir and, and different other towns or, or, or sections, if you will. And so, um, so with that, um, there's, a lot, there's a lot still out there that are against Israel. They're against the children. They're against the Jews. And we read it continuously, Sambal and Tobias and others who came, up, who came uh, against the building of the walls, right? Uh, and all of that. And so none of that stopped. They still don't like the Jews being there. They still don't want them there. But God had called them to separate themselves and sanctify themselves from the people of the land, not to be a part of what those people that are not Jews, those people are not following God Jehovah, those people that they're not to be a part of them. The second thing is, as you see on the screen commitments they made commitments to the Lord or towards the things of God so what God is having them do is move from the things of the world if you will and move towards the things of him I think that's important to kind of take note here and that's what we all should be as far as the children of the Lord we should be moving continuously away from the things of the world that affect us, that impact us, that stumble us, that, that cause us to fall into temptation or sin, those things that are not good for us from the, Lord, or from the world. And we should always make then a d decision in our minds to move things towards God. And move towards him. So separation and commitment. They've made the separation and they have committed. They've committed to follow the Lord. How do I know that? Well, Nehemiah 10.29 says, to, this is what they said. To walk in God's law, 
observe and do all the commandments of the Lord, his ordinances and statutes. So everything, in other words, that God, that, that is of the Lord, they're saying, this is what we're committing to. We're committing to walk in the word, okay? Walking in God's law. We're, we're committed to observing, seeing, and doing, not just knowing the commandments of God, but also doing the commandments of God. Two big different things there. And then his ordinances and his statutes. So everything they're saying, we are committing to, to, to move towards God and away from the things of the world. But, but how does something like this happen? I mean, how does one, within our own minds and our own hearts, make a decision, a commitment to move away from the things of the world? And, and I don't think for each of you here tonight that I need to explain to you what the things of the world are. Those things that are not of God. If you have any questions after the service, hey, ask me. But, but really, things that are just not edifying for you. Things that are, that, are, that are not of the Lord. Things that are not uh, identified in the Word. Uh, those kinds of things. We have to separate ourselves from those. But it first comes from a revival. I think it comes from a revival in our hearts first. And then a revival in our minds. And, and as I look back and I, and I reviewed back the chapters preparing for tonight, I'm looking back and seeing, Lord, where did the revival start? I think Chris mentioned that last Wednesday about a revival, which is leading to this commitment or a recommitment. We might call it today a rededication, right? Right? I mean, we, we, uh, there might be some of you here tonight who have walked with the Lord and then all of a sudden you, you've backslidden with the Lord and then you've rededicated your life, you've recommitted your life back towards the things of God away from the things of the world. You see how it works. And so I was thinking in reviewing back, it's like, well, Lord, where is the starting point? So I went to chapter 10. No. I went to chapter 9. No, it's not there either. I went to chapter 8 and I went, oh, he, here's the beginning. Here's where it all started. Because prior to chapter 8, they're doing a lot of building and they're doing a lot of renovating and they're doing a lot of physical stuff. Albeit that Nehemiah is still praying, seeking the Lord, fasting, doing all the things that he had begun doing early on since leaving Babylon. He hasn't changed. He's still doing those things, still maintaining his relationship, in other words, with the Lord. But I look back and I say, wow, Lord, this must be where it started. This is where I can see it started. Chapter 8, we see that first it tells us about Ezra who reads the law. He's reading the word of God, right? I mean, when we hear the word of God, or we read the word of God in our devotion time, or the Holy Spirit reminds us of something we have read or something we've heard in pertaining to the Word of God, immediately something happens within us. Does it not? Something happens. And that thing that happens many times is what's called conviction. Not guilt, but conviction. Conviction happens in our hearts. And our minds start to dwell upon that conviction. And the Word of God here is the starting point to where we're at today and where we're at now in chapter 11. Now, chapter 11 through 13 to the end of this book really speaks of more of a, of a reestablishing of things. But chapter 8 speaks of conviction. Chapter 9, we read, then starts with the confession, okay? You might call it repentance, but nonetheless, the word of God has, has brought upon their hearts a conviction. This is what we're not doing. This is what we've been doing. This has not been pleasing to God. And therefore, they're convicted. And then we read in chapter 9 about the confession or the repentance that takes place. And then in chapter 10, as Chris read last week and studied last week for us, we see that there's then a, a rededication, a recommitment towards God, leaving the things of the world again 
and moving towards the things of God. There's a rededication. And chapters 11 through 13, beginning tonight with chapter 11, we then see that there's a reestablishing of Jerusalem. A full reestablishing of things. Ending with some of what I would call, you know, the questions of the why. Why were the reforms made? Why were there principles of separation? Different things that go on. Kind of the why. And so things are going to change from this point on, leading to the end of this book in Nehemiah. Well, let's look at verse 1. And let's, let's see here. Let's look at verse 1. I'm going to take this in chunks, but to give you an understanding is that there's a need for people to be populated in Jerusalem. That's what needs to happen. And so there's volunteers, those who want to come into Jerusalem and, and be there. And there are some who frankly don't. We're going to find out why. Then Nehemiah names, which is even from the list of Zerubbabel, that, that coming, that wave of people. The leaders, it's pretty much word for word, the leaders and who they represent who are there living in, going to live in the city of Jerusalem. And then it's going to speak to us about those who are living outside the city of Jerusalem. So you have two groups of people. Those who are living in the city. Those who are going to be living outside the city. Okay? And so that's really what we're talking about this evening. There's a lot of neat things that I think that are going to be beneficial for us. So let's look at verse 1 of chapter 11 of Nehemiah. It says, Now the leaders of the people dwelt at Jerusalem... The rest of the people cast lots to bring one out of ten to dwell in Jerusalem, the holy city. That's an underline, the holy city. And nine-tenths were to dwell in other cities. So it's pretty easy to understand what's going on here. The, there's leaders of the people. They're living in Jerusalem. They're going to live in Jerusalem. And now they're going to cast lots. There's people who are going to live there voluntarily, want to live there, but now they've got to cast lots for some reason. But one of the things is, oh, and also that it looks as though there'll be about a 10% of the total population would be living in Jerusalem, about 10%. So what is the holy city? Why does Nehemiah refer to Jerusalem as the holy city? Well, the first reason is, is that that's the place that God chose to place his name. That's the place where he said, you're going to build my temple, and in that temple is where I'm going to dwell. So in other words, Jerusalem was the place to be, to be close to the Lord. Now, even today, if you go to Israel, and you always fly into Tel Aviv, you fly into Tel Aviv, you're there at the beach, it's a beachside city, very, very, very secular. Now, you move closer as you're heading towards the holy city, and you move through the desert, you pass through the, you kind of go to the Dead Sea, and you make a right, and then you kind of go up all the way, right? You pass Masada on the left, and you keep going, 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 going up to Jerusalem, up to Jerusalem. Now, as you're getting closer and closer and closer, different townships, Decapolis is on the way as well, you're going to then see that, well, things get a little different. Things aren't as secular as they are in Tel Aviv. Tel Aviv is very, very secular. Uh, their idea, I've heard, is of, of the Sabbath, the Shabbat, is that so they can get their beach chairs out on the beach ahead of everybody else. That's what I've heard. And it's like, so that's really what their mindset is. That's what they're thinking about in Tel Aviv. But the closer you get to Jerusalem, if you want to call it this, the more religious... It looks the more religious the people will be okay and so so in that that's no different here it'd be a great place to be in the in the city in Jerusalem to be near the temple of the Lord is and would be really the best place to be so why did only some live and some didn't live in Jerusalem some wanted to live in the holy city and for those who didn't, then Nehemiah's like, okay, we still need to populate this, so what we need to do is cast lots. Kind of like, hey, we're going to choose. It's kind of like a raffle. 
All your names are in a hat. And what's going to happen is when I pull your name out, you're living in Jerusalem. And what that means, that means something. Because maybe that person or that family that's going to be now living in Jerusalem, maybe they were farmers. Maybe they were agricultural things, uh, people. Maybe, maybe they were into livestock. Maybe they were into that and they weren't into city dwelling, right? It's a big difference, the city of Jerusalem versus outside the city. It's a whole different way of life and a whole different focus. It's not easy living next to the temple. It's not easy possibly living in Jerusalem, in the shadow of the temple of the Lord. Wherever you would go, you would see the temple. Everything's happening and concentrated around the temple. All of the offerings, all of the sacrifices, of course, all of the annual feasts, different things going on. You see the busyness of things. You see the ministry going on. You're always reminded that's where God dwells. That's where things happen, according to the Lord. So maybe, just maybe, some people didn't want to live in Jerusalem because there was greater accountability. Being under the shadow of the temple, being around there, it's like, well, they're a lot more accountable now because they're there around it every single day and every single night. Maybe because they weren't living as they should have or could have. Maybe they weren't being holy themselves. And so they're like, well, no, it's not best for me to be living in Jerusalem. I don't want that, have to deal with that every day. Or like I said earlier, maybe they just wanted to pursue farming. Maybe they just wanted to live that agrarian lifestyle, you know? Raising chickens and cows and sheep and whatnot. Maybe that's what they were into. And they just eh, didn't have anything to do with spirituality. It just had to do with the fact of what their preference was. They just would rather be farmers. Maybe also would be problematic living in Jerusalem. Is that even in this time, all of their enemies were not gone. Every, all the enemies weren't gone. There were still the, the Sanballats and Tobiases out there seeking uh, revenge or seeking to attack those in the city of Jerusalem. So then maybe they thought, oh, it's a little dangerous. I don't want to deal with the attacks and I don't want to deal with those things. And maybe there's some persecution that they were afraid of that would happen if someone attacked the city and then there they were, the inhabitants, and they'd be part of that whole persecution. And you know, and I thought to myself, it's like, Lord, I'm sometimes that way. Not all the time. But I'm sometimes that way in the sense to where I don't want to live in the holy city. I sometimes think I don't want to be always around the things of God in the sense of reminding me of things. I just, that's just how it is sometimes with me. And at times I don't think we want to live in the holy city. Sometimes I don't think that maybe we want to fully always be about the things of God. Or that closeness with it. We, don't, we just kind of want to chill and kind of be outside the city. Do our own thing. You know, and it's interesting because I think either... With this context of scripture, with the actual living in a city or spiritually applying it to the fact that maybe we sometimes don't want to be close to the Lord. We don't want to be accountable to God. We don't want to be of the things of the Lord. We'd rather be outside the city. We'd rather be outside the gates. Doing our own thing. Living our own life. Living life the way that we want it. Because there's way too much accountability. There's way too much, as I read in the Word, if I'm doing my devotions daily, it's like there's so much conviction going on. Oh man, and there's so much repentance going on in my life. Every time I get convicted, it's like, Lord, I realize I have to repent now. Maybe, maybe I maybe just don't want to do that. It's easier living out beyond the city. It's easier living out 
amongst the peoples of the land. It's way easier. So I think about that even in my own life, spiritually. But I think to myself then immediately that, but isn't our God a God that because of the difficulties and because of the problems of, that we encounter by following Him and serving Him and being obedient to Him, that He will take special care of us? That He will watch after you? I mean, that's the kind of God that we follow. That's the kind of Lord that we serve and have given our lives to. Job 10.12 says, You have granted me life and favor, and your care has preserved my spirit. An amazing verse out of Job. You have granted me, you have given me life, you have given me favor, Lord. And you have taken care of me and you have preserved me. Hebrews 2.6 says, But one testified in a certain place, saying, What is man that you are mindful of him? Or the son of man that you take care of him? No matter where we're at, I mean, if we're in the city, if we're in the holy place, and we're still, you know, dealing with conviction, and we're still dealing with repentance, feeling like we're repenting every day for something, convicted every moment over something, God will take care of you in that. God will preserve you through that. And for you and me, because we're all the same, for you, for you and me to be closer to God, we have to move into His city. We have to move into His holy city to be close to God. Don't expect to be close to God and live outside the city, in other words. It ain't going to work. It's not going to be the same because it, the further away you are from the Lord, the more all the peoples of the land will influence you. See, because it's in the holy city, it's being close to Jesus that will preserve you. It will protect you. That's the place of safety. That's the place where you're safe is when you're close to Jesus. That's also the place where you learn and where we grow in our relationship with God. We won't grow outside the city, among the peoples of the land, not outside of His covering. Isaiah 33, 20 says, Let your eyes be resting on Zion, the town of your holy feasts, you will see Jerusalem, a quiet resting place, a tent will not, which will not be moved, whose tent pins will never be pulled up, and whose cards will never, cords will never be broken. So that's how the Lord looks upon Zion. That's how he looks upon his holy city. That's where everything is happening. You see, the place for we as Christians where it's happening is in the holy city, is with Jesus, is with his word, is dwelling under the inspiration of the, of the Holy Spirit, walking in the Spirit. All of those things is dwelling in his holy city. That's where you need to be. That's where I need to be on a daily basis. Psalm 46, 4 and 5 says, this is beautiful. There is a river whose streams shall make glad the city of God, the holy place of the tabernacle of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God shall help her just at the break of dawn. Hallelujah. huh? Man, you read that verse, it's like, a river whose streams shall make glad the city of God. There's peace there. There's joy when we're with the Lord and in His holy city. It's a place where we get to tabernacle and have relationship with the Lord is when we're close to Him. And it's in that place where we seek the Lord is where He's at. He's in the middle of where we're seeking Him. God will help. Just at the break of dawn. You see, when you're needing something, 
When, when you're at your last rope, the last knot in your rope and you're hanging on, when you are at your wit's end, when you are so flustered and so flabbergasted and so, I am so done. You ever been that way? <laughs> I have. It's like, I'm, I'm just done, man. I'm ready to throw the towel in. There's too much of this going on, too much of that going on, too much of this, too much of that, too much. I've kind of had it. I just want to give up. But just at the break of dawn, God arrives. I mean, just at the break of dawn. When you and I maybe finally have decided not to follow our own advice or the advice of others or try to do things in our own strength, just at the break of dawn, man, the Lord comes through and rescues us. See, the further away from the holy city, the less holy they needed to be. Same with us. The less holy we need to be, the further away we are from the Lord. I'm not reading my Bible no more than maybe once a month or four times a month. Okay, then I, I'm just not accountable to it anymore. It's not feeding me anymore. I'm away from the holy city. I find doing things my own way and my own strength and my own thought and intellect. I end up wanting to live my life the way I want to live it. You know, I thought that they must not have understood, or maybe they did. Maybe they just forgot it. That even being outside the city, God is still there. Amen? <laughs> I thought, oh, he's still there. Maybe they didn't want him looking over their shoulder. Have you ever been that way? You're doing something or you've done something in the past and you forget that God is even there? I mean, God's in the room with you. God's in the car with you. God's in that, with that computer with you. God's that cell phone with you. God is right there with you. We can't forget that. We can try to move out of the city. We can try to get away from God. But God is, as we know, omnipresent. He's always there. He's always with us. God sees everything. And God is everywhere. One of the things, only in verse 1 alone, is the fact that the leaders, they, they, they wanted to be close to the Lord. It says, now the leaders of the people dwelt at Jerusalem. They want to be close to the Lord. They, they wanted also to be an example for other people to see. They loved God. And they loved His dwelling place. They couldn't get enough of God. They wanted to be there. And they, as the leaders, were setting an example. They were willing they were willing to be close to God and accountable to the things of God. Verse 2, it says, And the people blessed all the men who willingly offered themselves to dwell at Jerusalem. So those who willingly volunteered is what they're saying. Volunteered, hey, I want to live in Jerusalem. Hey, pick me. I, I want to be there. And, and that's what they And the people around them, even those that might not want to live in Jerusalem, they were still like, whoa, it blesses me. <laughs> I'm like, man. Now, it's interesting that word blessed means praised. They praised them for volunteering and wanting to willingly offer themselves to dwell at Jerusalem. Maybe they were like, well, I don't think I can do what you do or what you're going to do. Man, that's amazing. You know, when you tell someone what they've done is awesome or you tell someone what they're involved with is amazing, it's really cool, you're praising them. You're praising them. You're blessing them. I mean, you think about it with these leaders. They, they could have lived outside the city, no problem. They could have been desired to be landowners or secular businessmen or whatever the case is. But to their credit, man, they pursued the right thing. 
They did the right thing and they wanted to pursue God and the things of God and therefore live and dwell within the city. Psalm 122 9 says this Because of the house of the Lord our God, I will seek your good. Because of the house of the Lord, because of that holy city, because of living close to you, Lord, I will seek your good because of that. Now, in verses 3 through 24, it's going to tell us about all the different leaders. And I'm not going to read all of these folks for you. I know Chris did last week some 87 names. Chris, was that what it was? 87 or 84 names? Whoa, very, very important. And, but here, I'm just going to just summarize this for you. That these are the leaders and the people within these different tribes who are going to be living in the city. Inside Jerusalem, remember we've got two types of people, inside Jerusalem, outside of Jerusalem. Two things we can glean from those scriptures, 3 through 24. Great examples. Great examples of people who are wanting to be close to God. I kind of look at that when we see folks, be it in our church or in ministry over the years, people who desire to be involved in the things of God. I see that. It's like, wow, they, it's so exciting for me and so uh, blessed for me to see folks that are a good example to other folks who want to serve and their examples on what it means to serve the Lord. I think that's a great thing. And these folks here are good examples that they want to live next to God. They want to live in the holy city next to the temple. It's a good example for others to follow. It's a good example for us too as we see other folks serving the Lord or be involved in the things of the Lord. Those things, they're in the city, next to the temple, doing the things for the Lord. And it encourages us. It's a great example for us to go, man, I'd like to do that too. I'd like to be a part of that work. The other thing here is that they're doing, I see, is that they're a good foundation is being established. Remember, they're reestablishing things now. 11 through 13 is a reestablishing phase for Jerusalem. And so there's a good, a great foundation being laid by all of these leaders. And if you read all of these names on your own, you're going to see that many of them, the sons of this guy, the sons of that guy and that guy, which were the high priests and those others of the tribe of Levi and those of the Nethanim and those other things, other people that were leaders and those sons of the leaders, etc., what a blessing it is. They're, they're laying such a good foundation. So it's very important, the foundation with anything, whether it's this city in context tonight or a church, it's important that there be laid a good foundation, solid people, solid leadership, good examples for people to follow so that others can learn and grow and be encouraged by their examples and be encouraged to know that Man, this thing is being built on such a strong foundation. Well, let's move then to chapter or to verse, chapter 25. Woo, it's not even here. Uh, verse 25 through 36. That tells us then towards the uh, end of this chapter about those who are dwelling outside the city of Jerusalem. I don't want you to think that all these folks outside of the city of Jerusalem are just a bunch of heathens, okay? <laughs> that they're just out there, they're just away from the temple, they don't want to be in the holy city because they don't. I mean, it's not, I can't say it's everybody. I don't know. So I think these folks are important as well. Think about it. You and I are able to go to Walmart in our city. You and I are able to go to the neighborhood Walmart or go to Food Lion, or go to Martin's. I mean, we have a, a, an abundance, an overabundance, I personally think, of, of uh, shopping places here in this town. Man, the choices we have to go buy groceries. It's amazing. Well, they didn't have Martin's in Jerusalem. They didn't have Walmart in Jerusalem. 
These folks, I think, are important because they needed folks outside the city to be farmers, to raise livestock for food, food needs. Hebrews 6, 7 says this, For a land drinking in the fragrant rain and producing good plants for those whom it has worked has a blessing from God. So it is good. It is good to, if God is called to, be the farmer, to be that livestock raiser, whatever it is. Part of the replenishing for the city is that people needed to work the lands as well. Because from it would then be the production of food for king and country. Because remember, this wasn't under the, king, the rule of King David or Solomon or any of the Jewish kings. It was under the king of Persia. The Persian king had rule over all this area. So it was very good because they would also receive things as a result of their labor. So I think we can say truthfully that both are youth useful. Whether it's city folk or whether it's country folk. Either way can be very, very useful. 1 Corinthians 12.27 says, Now you are the body of Christ. And every one of you, the separate parts of it. So whether that's in this portion of scripture tonight with the city and the, outside the city, the farmers and whatnot, or if it's with even a church, just like ours, people have many different giftings. People have many different abilities. Yet we're all of the same body. They were all of the same body there, whether inside or outside the holy city. And I see it no different even within our church that there's the body of Christ and there's unity within the diversity. Paul mentions that. And so in that diversity is where you have the city folks and you've got the country folks. And that's, what's, that's what it's about. It's pretty simple. And we're all unified under one idea, one belief. And that is Jesus Christ. We can all agree on that. I'm not a farmer. Someone else can farm better than I can. But maybe I can do something in the city. But the fact remains that my farmer friend and myself, we believe that Jesus Christ is Lord. That's the important thing. So in closing tonight over this particular chapter... What we read here, it's a time of reestablishing for the people of Israel in the land of Judah. It's a time specifically to reestablish the city, the holy city of Jerusalem. Things that possibly had been forgotten, things that had not possibly been practiced, things that would bless the Lord and bless each other. They, they obviously weren't doing it. And if you read further to the end of the Old Testament, I encourage you to do this, read the book of Malachi. The book of Malachi, who was a contemporary of Nehemiah at this time, he writes about, well, I won't give the end of the story. Let's go to the end of Nehemiah, and then I'll say read Malachi. Because it's not too pretty. It's not too encouraging. But here we have encouragement. There's a lot of neat things happening here that we cannot discount. What Nehemiah and Ezra and the rest of the leaders are doing is they're bringing back the people to the things of the Lord. That's the important thing. These guys are wanting to bring people back to the worship of God. It's important, I think, I really think so, guys. I think it's so important to, to reestablish our closeness with the Lord. To get back into the holy city, in other words. To get back to those things of the Lord for your lives personally, for the lives of your family, possibly. But what will it take? What will it take? To bring you into the holy city. What do I have to do. To get back to these kinds of things. Well I have to move into the holy city. I have to want to be there. I have to desire to want to be. Near the temple. Near the Lord. 
near where things are happening, near where God is moving through his people or in his church. That's where I want to be. That's where I desire to be. Have you guys ever sensed uh, this kind of move that maybe needs to take place in your hearts? I'm going to invite Kiri to come on up here and Matt. and We're just going to take a time of seeking the Lord right now. Just a time of seeking the Lord. We call it an afterglow. and Just a t- short time of seeking the Lord, kind of just soaking in the presence of God. And If you need a touch from the Lord, a healing... Or, or, or something like that for you physically or your body something going on physically with you then, then come on over here to my right it'd be your left and then like right here in the middle there's going to have be a couple leaders here too and um, you know what if you just need prayer just come up for prayer during this time of worship Or if you just want to stay in your seat and just chill with Jesus and enjoy and just be with him, that's good too. But we provide these things for you so that you'd have an opportunity to share and an opportunity to just offload things to the Lord with a brother or sister. One final verse before we start. Romans 11.33 Because This is what it means to dwell in the holy city, I believe. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. You see, it's in that place, in the holy city, being next to God, is to where you'll begin to tap into those riches and wisdom knowledge I'm not talking financial stuff you'll be able to begin searching his ways it's just a great opportunity guys it's just a great opportunity to come and get that Sabbath get that rest amen